and this issue is is the driving force in my life more than comedy more than anything it, it's what propels me or blocks me this is like a brick wall this is like if you can't get past your intrusive thought if you can't get past the fear if you can't if you, it, it's so noisy me not shaking hands i haven't shaken a hand in in a long time but i don't because i don't want to get triggered i welcome and need and pray for coping skills that allows me to function. There's no other answer. And if I have any regret, it's that it took me till my mid 40s to identify, help myself. Hello, and welcome back to the Get to Know OCD podcast. My name is Dr. Patrick McGrath. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at NoCD. NoCD is an online platform for the treatment of obsessive compulsive and related disorders. If you're looking for help for OCD or other conditions, check us out at nocd.com or treatmyocd.com. And you can subscribe to our Get to Know OCD podcast or go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to the NoCD channel as well. Today, I am honored to have Howie Mandel. No, I'm honored to talk to you, buddy. Well, thank you. I, I got to say that, you know, obviously, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you've probably seen some of the ads that I've been in. I did a, a, a campaign for no CD. And, you know, I kind of inadvertently made it known that, you know, I have this issue. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that further. But uh, so I became synonymous with OCD and, and uh, mental health and maybe trying to remove the stigma of dealing with mental health. So when I was approached to maybe be a spokesperson, mm -hmm. you know, I thought, oh, that makes sense, you know, and I'll do it. And then the truth is that I am incredibly serious about yeah. this issue. And this issue is, is the driving force in my life more than comedy, more than anything. It, it's what propels me or blocks me or whatever fuel is ignited at the at the moment but when i got and i'm not just saying this because you're sitting here and because that sign is behind <laughs> me i'm saying it because i i truly uh what you're doing and what this company is doing and uh is phenomenal and it's actually saving lives and when i got involved with your company you informed me uh, you gave me some stats yeah. that I was not aware of. I only knew that me and a few people that I know intimately ha have this issue. How prevalent this is? One in 40. One in 40, mm -hmm. which is crazy. The, the wrong word, but it is. <laughs> yeah, we'll, go uh, it. Uh, we'll go with that. <laughs> uh, one in 40. And not only that, how that's what we know. Right. But w what we don't know is how many people have it and uh, are misdiagnosed yes. or not going, even if they are diagnosed, the uh, where, whatever path they're taking, uh, that person or people or clinic is not really versed specifically in this issue. Right. And the thing that keeps me alive and the thing that that saved my life is to know that there are answers mm -hmm. and to know there is not one answer to know that sometimes you know you try something and maybe that thing that you try doesn't or or you don't adhere to it so then sure. you, you, there are different paths to oh. take mm -hmm. and uh, you you guys provide that you provide diagnostics which is great, you know, because you may think uh, you have it. You provide um, access, which is the most important thing. Because I would agree. Mm -hmm. I live here in LA, and I'm in show business, and which kind of is kind of a, a get out of jail free card to say there's something wrong, and I go <laughs> to my therapist or I go to my psychiatrist, and and that. But in the middle of the country, sure that does not exist, that, that that kind of even conversation with your own family. And it didn't, you know, I'm from Canada. You don't go, you know, I can't uh, stop thinking of this ritual or this number and I can't move and I can't leave. And you make excuses for uh, not showing up someplace and right. not showing up for life. And you would never have, I wouldn't have shared that with my closest family member 
And I wouldn't, if I had, I don't know that they would have known what to do. So the fact that you have created accessibility where it's as close as your phone is and, and also affordability yeah. where you've gotten insurance companies on board and that it's so, you know, if you are embarrassed, which nobody should be, and there is no stigma, it takes care of that issue too, because you can go hide in your own place, right. download this, and help is right there. And you have therapists who are trained to really notice this and not look at you like, wait, what, what are you talking about? What was that you just said, right? Where some other therapists who aren't trained in OCD might hear what some of the obsessions people have and think, danger, bad something terrible. I mean, I've seen where new mothers have perinatal OCD and they've had their children taken away because they have intrusive thoughts about what if I were to harm my child. And so DCFS gets called and they take the child because they think this woman is dangerous this, right. or this dad is dangerous. Right. And they're not, they're, they're having intrusive thoughts and they're not dangerous. Right. The, well, if they're dangerous, they're dangerous to their own selves yeah not not to the other person you have these thoughts and these thoughts are so intrusive and so overwhelming that i can see why not not to uh trigger anybody but, but why you would want to do the ultimate to make it stop and people have done that and and that's another thing that i know you've been passionate about with getting the word out we don't want to lose more people because they have intrusive thoughts or images or urges. We want to help people recognize helps available for those things. And uh, one of my pet peeves right now, sure. and this is why I'm doing this podcast, this is why I'm doing the campaign, and this is why I, I want to talk about it even on my own uh, podcast. One of my pet peeves is that it has become part of the vernacular, yeah. you know, and when it becomes the part of the vernacular, I, I don't know that I'm using the, the, the right terminology, but you're disarming the issue. And I think we have to arm the issue so that we can fight it. And uh, when I can't tell you how many times a day somebody comes up to me and goes, I know I got a little bit of that OCD too. Mm -hmm. Well, mm, mm. you're persnickety. Yeah. You like things in order. Yeah, right. You dust a lot. Mm -hmm. You like things neat. You don't have this disorder. I hope you don't have this disorder. Yeah. And if you do, if somebody comes up to me and tells me they really do, it is... It's my biggest hurdle in life, you know, and it is this close to being incredibly debilitating. And the dichotomy um, for me has always been uh, this is, f for just a, a, an example, this is like a brick wall. This is like if you can't get past your intrusive thought, yeah. if you can't get past the fear, if you can't if you, it, it's so noisy and so, you know, I talk about seeing the Howard Hughes movie or knowing his history where mm -hmm. he ended up at the end of his life, a very bright, intelligent guy ended up naked in the fetal position in his room, peeing into a bottle, not being able to function. Yeah. I can't tell you how close I am to that at many times in my life, but my job and the way I, I you know, uh, kind of, uh, support my family and myself is the antithesis of right. of how I feel and what my brain is is doing. So I, I welcome and need and pray for coping skills that allows me to function and not even just function of showing up to an office someplace, but showing up out here mm -hmm. like I am now and being able to perform, you know, just normal life skills is really tough. And you talked about the fear, but OCD loves other emotions too. It loves guilt. It loves shame. It loves disgust. Have those played a role in your OCD as well? All of it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my, my uh, kind of explanation to people that don't understand it um, is a kind of a skipping record. You know, I, I don't think that, anybody alive has not uh, felt, um, you know, a, a weird thought goes through your mind. It just does. It's the flowing river. If you look at a river, you know, it'll be a beautiful flowing river and, 
and then a log goes by and then <laughs> something piece of trash goes by mm -hmm. that's what our minds are like yeah. you know yeah. in the course of a day you know uh, some weird thought some weird scary thought some weird i bet you it's bad luck i bet you you know i just feel like i want to tap that uh, the Knock top on of that wood, uh, yeah i just yeah, yeah. yeah i just want to <laughs> tap that door so take any of those moments mm -hmm. and then put it on a skipping record yeah you know and if you go, okay, I'm going to knock on wood because if I don't knock on wood, bad things are going to happen, which n anybody thinks of. So I got to knock on wood. I think bad. So there I knock on wood. But then I, in, in, in my world, sometimes when I'm triggered, I go, that wasn't really a knock. I right. hit lightly. Let me just knock on wood. Oh, now I just, th that wasn't a knock. I got to knock on that. <laughs> Am I just, am I, I don't know what I'm, I'm just, and I can get stuck in this till my knuckles are bleeding for hours and not show up to the, whatever the next thing is that I have to do in life and not to do. And as much as that sounds crazy, it's just your life, these thoughts, these intrusions stop you. And sometimes these intrusions are violent. Sometimes these intrusions are scary. Sometimes these intrusions are shameful. Sometimes these intrusions are, it's just like, it, they're, they're, you can't put into words what it is. So it's not me just being annoyed because, you know, this paper is here and it's not in the center of the table. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not yeah. what it is. Uh, that could be the beginning of something. By the same token, you know, people know that I don't shake hands. I know, and the more cognizant you are of how weird it is, the harder this issue is. You know, they say ignorance is bliss. It really yeah, is. Yeah. When you're aware of how crazy and silly that your um need your compulsion is and you can't stop it and you're aware it's more debilitating because i should be able to control it i know that that's not going to happen i know by the same token me not shaking hands i haven't shaken a hand in in a long time in therapy i have <laughs> you know as mm -hmm. the exposure therapy okay but mm -hmm. but um i um i don't and i don't and I don't know if this is good for me, but I don't because I don't want to get triggered. Now, yeah. nine out of 10 times, I'll shake somebody's hand and I shake somebody's hand. And I know intellectually that if I shake your hand, um, I'm, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to get sick. And even if you have a cold, you know, and, and I can go wash my hand and mm -hmm. I'll be, that. this is what I know. Yeah. I, I do know. Yeah. That what kills me is sometimes I can't get past that. So if I shake somebody's hand and their hand's a little bit moist and I feel the moistness on my hand and normally that would, you'd go, ooh, anybody would go, ooh. Yeah. I'm not talking about your hand in particular, <laughs> but I'm sure it's ooh. It, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I will go to the uh, bathroom and, and wash my hand and then I think, oh, well, I didn't, I, I didn't wash it enough so yeah. you know i need to go back and do it with hot water and then I, I probably missed a spot i'll go back and i've been in that circle at the sink for hours and hours and hours and missed meetings and missed and i can't get myself away and i know i've washed my hands you know a hundred times already yeah. and i can't i can't get past that and that's what is debilitating and that's why people just wanted to stop and you, you touch on a point there that i think most people don't truly understand about OCD is, and, and you've probably been told in the past, well, just stop it, Howie, just, just stop it, which of course. Okay, <laughs> yeah. that was the answer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. the, people don't get the fact that you logically get it, but emotionally, the fight, flight, or freeze response is screaming at you in your head, and that's really what you're responding to is an emotional thing, not a logical thing. Absolutely, and it's that emotions are bizarre i'm not a doctor and i can't speak to it but i i feel like we as human beings for the most part in the healthiest sense have the ability or should have the ability to modify you know there's there's never one thing going on at the same time in your mind you know uh, standing on stage 
but then being aware that you're standing on stage because you know in, in the in the most classic sense some people can't perform on stage because they're horrified yeah but what are you horrified about? R really, the truth is, what are you horrified about? Like, even if you stand there and you said something and they didn't laugh or they thought you were terrible or, they, I mean, ultimately, how would it affect your life? It doesn't really affect your life. It doesn't. I'm just talking about, this is not OCD. I'm yeah. talking about the inability to even, when people get in front of in front of a large group of people, sometimes if they're not a trained performer or they're not a performer, they can't even speak, right. they lose their voice. So that fear kind of stops their life, kind of stops whatever they wanted to do. Well, imagine that weird kind of thought being the forefront of almost everything you're doing in life. Yeah. That, that fear stops you because they say public speaking is one of the biggest fears. But what is, when you think about it, what is the fear? What, what what are you afraid of that you won't that people won't say you're the best public speaker that people will like it does, it will not kill you it won't really affect you if you get up there and you do a bad job your life will probably go on exactly the way it was the day before so i'm just putting that kind of fear that totally stops you i'm using that as an example to yep. say that's the same fear of me thinking my hand isn't clean and I can't even step out into the world until I believe every last iota of bacteria is gone and it stops my life. Yes. Going back to your childhood when this is there, but you don't have a name for it, mm -hmm. you don't get it. How, how, do you, how do you manage life? How do you explain to people what's going on? Or are you really good at hiding things and just... I wasn't good at hiding things. There was not a, a, a name. I'd never heard the term, uh, uh, you know, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s. I'm going to be, uh, I'm 68 this year. I'll be 69 this year. I'll be 70 next year. I'd, I'd never heard of it. Sure. Um, my uh, quirkiness was um, probably considered quirkiness. I didn't have a lot of friends. Um, it was an accepted quirkiness. Like I, even I have a younger brother who's three years younger than me, you know, he was my little brother. He can beat the crap out of me now, but then I could beat mm -hmm. the crap out of him. So he knew that if I was coming after him, if he just grabbed the lid to the laundry hamper and held it up, that was like a super shield. Mm -hmm. But nobody, mm -hmm. nobody questioned that. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom used to get mad at me because I would take every towel there was into the shower with me. So I'd cover everything oh. and I'd only use a towel on part of my body for part. I was using all the towels. Okay. Okay. But uh, this was all part of it. You know, uh, when I was really young, um, everybody, learned uh, to tie their shoelaces sure. and I learned to tie my shoelace. But if my shoelace came undone and it was on the ground, dragged on the ground or got wet in a puddle, then I wouldn't retie my shoe because I didn't wanna touch the laces. Okay. So I would, uh, first of all, I had a weird walk cause I tried to keep my shoes on cause the, they were not tied. They would come untied and I would not tie them. And I was better off I felt more comfortable being made fun of that I didn't know how to tie my shoes than saying, because I didn't know how to articulate, I don't, I don't want to touch my, I don't want to touch my laces because they're icky. Yeah. You know, I didn't know that, I didn't want to say that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that, you know, I was amazed that you could touch your icky laces, but if I saw you touch your icky laces, then my whole day was, following your hands and seeing what you touched and, and trying to remember everything that I would not touch. I mean, I was so fucking busy, you know, uh, making, um, uh, you know, a plan, an escape plan yeah. from a room, uh, m making sure that I was aware of everything that was touched by what I felt was a contamination mm -hmm. and not going near it no talk about why I felt that way or what it was. And then, you know, things happened in my life that kind of exacerbated that, Sure, you know? So um, that's my, I don't have any memory of living any differently. In fact, the most at ease I am is now. I mean, which started in the, 
in my mid forties when I was forced, forced and on an ultimatum by my wife to go get help and to go get therapy, you know, cause she couldn't live with it anymore. You know, the, the, the person with OCD, I think all of us want to have some control. You know? yeah, well, yes, <laughs> and it's an illusion that we have to deal with that idea of being in control. But the person with OCD um, probably feels so out of control and spends their life trying to maintain, you know, if I could just get the dirt off my hands, I'll be happy. If I could just do this ritual and, you know, tap another seven times for the 700th time, then I'll be able to make my way you know, safely into the world, or I'll be able to, so you're, you're trying to control. And what, what you do, I can speak for myself, but I think this goes for others that are, we have a tendency to suck everybody into our void in the sense, well, with me specifically, because I am misophobic, because germs are a, a trigger for me, um, the people that I can control or are closest to me, I say, well, you, if you're gonna if you're gonna pick up my dish, then uh, can you just wash your hands first? Or if you're gonna do this, or can you do my laundry in a separate little thing? Or mm -hmm. can I? Uh, I built a guest house where I can go if the kids coughed. So finally, my wife just got tired, and the first thing that my therapist said to me was, um, "Here's the here's the issue, Howie." Because she said, I can't do this. I'm just tired. I can't do this. My wife said, I can't do yeah. this anymore. Yeah, yeah. And unless you go get help, and which I, I didn't think I needed help. I think they needed help <laughs> living Just with do me. what I want you to do. And, and, and it's, it's all yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it, my therapist said, here's, here's the thing. How you, we, all of us can't control the world. And not the world, not everybody has to live in your world. But you have made a choice. You have to live in theirs. Yeah. So what I'm gonna do is give you coping skills to live in the world mm -hmm. that you, the only thing you ever have control of, and this goes for anybody with anything, wh whether it's just happiness, whether it's productivity, whether it's your mental health, whether it's OCD, the only person that can make it work ultimately is you. It's you that has to download the app. Right. It's you that has to take the, if, if, if medication is something that is something that you believe might work for you, it's you that has to take it. If meditation or exposure therapy or whatever, you, ultimately you as a doctor can tell me what to do, but yeah. ultimately I have to make the decision to listen to you. Right. And, and this made a lot of sense, you know, and in so many, I, I, I kind of took my therapy one step further and realize that whether it's show business or business or success, we're all responsible f for ourselves and we're all responsible for where we are in life and how happy we are and how content and how productive yeah. and maybe even how mentally healthy we are. You know, even though I think that this is possibly genetic, I don't know what the, what the, <laughs> There is, um, you, you know that it's about a 2% in the general population. If you've got a first degree relative, it can go up to 20% chance. And if you've got a identical twin, it can go up to almost 60% chance. Wow. So, so what, I, what I'm saying is, and then it, but it is 100% my obligation to take care of it. Yeah. So, so I did, you know, and I took care of it and, uh, not only am I happy or not only am I coping and thriving, and I'm not saying I'm not cured. You know, I don't know that there is a cure. I never talk about it. I, I talk about learning to live with it and not let it rule your life, but you live the life you want to live. So this is what I, uh, the, my, my, I think that life is this wonderful game, but if you want to play a game, you know, you're going to get tired. You might even get injured. Yep. You might, but you get up and you want to play the game. Yep. So you're still going to take those kicks. There's no panacea where boom. And I don't know what normality is, but I'm just saying I don't think that's a word that even needs to exist. Right. You mm -hmm. know, I think the beauty is that no two people are alike. No, normality uh, kind of is. That word seems like 
it's like this and he's like this and she's like this and this is the way it is. The beauty is we're all unique yes. in our perspective, in our thoughts, in our process and whatever. But I am now able to function for the most part really well. Do I have dark moments and times? Many, yeah, many, they're really hard. The beauty is if you decided to, this is my, uh, go back to my analogy, if you decided you had a love of boxing and you wanted to box and you were the best boxer in the world and you were gonna be the, the, the champion of the world, even the champion of the world is may at times get knocked down, yep. may get punched in the face, yep. may feel pain, may get tired out in a 12th round and it's just like that you can't even catch your breath. Yeah. But you love this game, you're gonna do it. And anybody that does something with a passion, and life should be a passion, anybody is always going to feel the weakness. So it's not this thing where I don't feel anything, I have not constant joy, I have constant productivity. That's not what it is. But what I will tell you as somebody who's suffered in the darkest moments, it's worth it. Yeah. You know, it's worth it. And it's like you get up today and it's storming outside and there's a you know, a huge storm, you know, and two days later the sun comes out and it's a beautiful day and it's worth staying inside for a minute and weathering that storm and then coming out to the sunshine and just enjoying your day. I love that. And one thing I'll add to the boxer that I think has been helpful for people is sometimes people say, I don't need a therapist. You, you even had thought that for a while too. And I talk about, well, that boxer, even though they're the world champion, still has a boxing coach. Yes. Right? So even the best boxer in the world has a coach. Well, I've always talked about, I've made this my, my uh, kind of uh, little saying in my pulpit, and I said, you know, we, we live in a rough world, and this world, if we just, if we just took care of our mental health the way we take care of our dental health, it would be really amazing. Uh, you know, as a, as a parent and as a human being growing up, I, I've never gone a year without going to the dentist. Right. And it, he or she will check for cavities, I'll get some x-rays, I get a cleaning. Lovely. Yes, <laughs> I, I get a cleaning, I just take care of it, whether there's yeah. pain or not. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in place in our curriculum where somebody can, what you do on the app, where somebody can just diagnose you, ask you a couple of questions, find out how you're reacting to things, finding out, and that's the hardest thing in life. And whether you have, I'm, 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 you know, I'm speaking past OCD, but I don't think there's anybody in life that at some point doesn't need a coping skill. The things we deal with, like, listen, uh, nobody gets out of here alive. Nope. There's so much pressure. The people you know will, you know, people are getting diagnosed with things. People's uh, uh, um, marriages will end horrible things will happen. How do you cope? They don't go, it's just not part of our curriculum. Right. And the fact that this one problem of OCD is an incredibly massive issue, as you said, one in, one in 40, and it's just not part of our curriculum, even to check, yeah. even to check to see, like maybe, maybe you have it. Maybe, I'll, I won't even say maybe, I bet you somebody that you are interacting with in your daily life or that you know is related to you does have it. No so, so no doubt, a hundred percent. So educate yourself, download it, find out. You know, silence is the is the biggest factor, and there isn't anybody alive that doesn't need help, and we don't ask for help. Yeah, we don't ask for help. We just don't. And in 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 the mental world, yeah, in the mental health world, you know, if we're sitting in an office in, uh, you know, the middle of America and somebody says, can you help me with these books? You go, nah, nah, you know, my, my back's out, yeah. my back is out. <laughs> and everybody will hand you a card to a, uh, their chiropractor. Sure. But if we're going through something in our minds and in life, I mean, I don't think outside of talking to your doctor, or your therapist, or a loved one or in the world, you can't say, uh, I just, I'll be honest with you, I can't function right now. I, 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 and I, I need to go someplace and cry. I need to, uh, I just, uh, you can't do that. Yeah. You know, but you can say my leg is hurting. You could say my tooth is hurting. I was talking about mental health. Yes, versus, and the dentist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I have personally gone 
to Washington on Capitol Hill just to ask, uh, you know, the government to push insurance companies to parody the support they have for mental health that they do for physical health. Absolutely. You know, if we see, you know, it's a, it's a sad statement in our world because if, you know, if they see an x-ray and there's a fracture on a bone, you know, you can get coverage and maybe you need to go to physical therapy, but um, there's no x-ray for OCD, you know? And that's why people need to uh, download the app, make an appointment and talk to somebody and find out even if that's the issue, yeah. you know, you're getting, uh, you know, that's telehealth right there, right. you know, and, but there'll be a therapist at your, you know, service. Right. That's what this does. The, I didn't know where to go and who to talk to. Yeah. This is your path to who to talk to and where to go. So I just hope, and that's why I'm here on the podcast. Thank you. And that, uh, I just hope that more people, and I'm telling you as a, um, a survivor, mm -hmm. you know, who is continuing to fight, you know, to, to survive and to be able to function because life is hard. It's really, really hard. And uh, I know that's somebody watching or listening to this probably thinks, you know, he doesn't know what hard is. And you know what? I think a lot of people are in really dire need and in hardship and suffering a lot more than I am right now. But it's ultimately hard what I talked to people about and even with OCD, there are, hard is all relative. It's how you are intaking, you know, for me, it's hard to touch a doorknob. I know that to most people, that's nothing. And I know intellectually that that's nothing. But the touch of a doorknob can send me down a dark path where I don't want to even survive. That's possible. It sounds silly. And it isn't silly when you are living it, when you are breathing it, and when you have no control over it. And I just I like to tell people there are answers. We were talking before we went on the air. Do you want to talk about some of your therapy? Always respectful of that for anybody, yeah. The truth mm -hmm. for me is this. Because you are a doctor, but I'm not. Uh, you did I play one on TV. Though. I did play one. <laughs> yes. uh, is that if I told you what I do, and I've been in, you know, I, I will tell you that I've been involved in exposure therapy. I've been involved in pharmaceuticals and medicine. I do take medicine right now. I do take a pharmaceutical right now. I... Uh, talking and being open about what I'm doing, just having somebody to talk to yeah. is is been really good for me. I don't go into specifics because I feel like this has happened before at the beginning, you know, I've been kind of out about it for over 20 years. Uh, and when I did talk about things I was doing, I would get bombarded by people going, you said that the, if you take this, it's got, sure. first of all, I don't know your biology. I don't know. I'm not prescribing anything and what i will tell you is this two two things one is there are many many paths correct many paths there isn't one answer to you know take this magic pill and you'll be fine those paths are different for each individual person and each individual case and each individual biology those paths are sometimes somewhat temporary, which means, I'll give you my uh, example. I was put on a medication that worked for a very short time. Mm. And then I think just by virtue of getting older and having your own body chemistry change they and do. biology, yeah. your, your hormone balance is different, then I wasn't the exactly the same biological right makeup that I was when I started taking it so that, you know, doses changed, different things changed. It's a constant, you know, uh, it's like playing tennis, yeah. you know, that ball doesn't keep coming over the same spot. It's, you know, you gotta, 
play defensively with mm-hmm. life. And that's all life, you know, shit happens. <laughs> yes, it and does. it's going to happen to everybody. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows what tomorrow brings, no. you know, and nobody knows how they're going to react and how they're going to fare in this world. But as long as there are possibilities and hope, and there are many in this particular issue, then it's worth treading that path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and I think that's great advice that keep keep pushing forward, right? Don't, don't be stuck. There's no other answer. There's mm-hmm. no other answer. And if I have any regret, it's that it took me till my mid 40s to identify, help myself, and I put a lot of people through a lot of hell because of the hell that I was going through. It's, it wasn't easy being my wife, being my kids, being my parents. Uh, I didn't really have a lot of friends as a kid. I didn't really uh, fare well in public. So it's not, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for me, but it's not easy for anybody around me. So. If I could take this opportunity to make a public apology to anybody who's ever <laughs> spent any dark time with me, I apologize. But I and I'm not making an excuse for it. But yeah. I, I'm I think I'm better today than a, a better person to be around, work with, and just uh, have in your life than I was 20 years ago. Did that quirkiness as a kid or things, or or maybe some of the solitude without some of the friends? Did that generate into some of the comedy work that you did? Well, or? you know, and that's also a, 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 that's a gift and a and a and a problem. So, for me, comedy, you know, I, as I tell people, everything I was ever punished for, expelled for, gotten in trouble for, alienated for, is what I get paid for. Yeah. Um, my, uh, you know, go to panacea is laughter you know sure. it always comes the 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 more uncomfortable some i am the darker something is the natural place is to try to laugh because if i don't laugh i'll cry and 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 the the truth of the matter is if you go look at any that the masks of theater are the tragedy and comedy mm-hmm. there's not that much different you know mm-hmm. tragedy is just an upside down smile yeah. so uh, and the worst times of my life I have the funniest stories. But if in, in, in order to kind of describe that, that's how we laugh. That's what humor is. You're always laughing at darkness. Yeah. Even if you're not laughing at your own darkness, if you're laughing, if you're a little kid and you're laughing at a clown falling down, what are you laughing at? The misfortune of somebody that you think looks funny hurting themselves. I mean, I just took the fun out of the circus, but that's what you're- <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> But that's what you're laughing at. Yeah. Even if you hear a joke, you know, two guys walk into a bar. Well, it's not a joke unless something horrific and awkward happens to one of them. Right. So I didn't know this and I couldn't articulate it. But at the most uncomfortable, weirdest moments, I try to uh, slough it off as kind of funny, weird, awkward. I love weird and awkward because that's where I live. And, you know we all feel like we are outcasts. We all feel like nobody gets it, that nobody's in our head. Nobody is in your, your head, but you should know that everybody is in their own head yeah. and everybody doesn't feel like they're invited to the party. And some people will say when they're feeling great, it's the scariest time for them because they're worried about when won't I feel great. They obsess about that. Mm-hmm. Yes, I just can't, I can't be complacent. I would love to be. Yeah but I can't be, and I'm not comfortable being. And that's why I do everything, that's one of my many um, kind of uh, lifesavers is distraction and being in the moment. And whether that distraction is being on stage doing stand up because I can't think about what's gonna happen, what did happen, it's just right now I'm standing there and I need to deliver, or it's being on a roller coaster, yeah. being scared to death. The, the, <laughs> the scarier, the th- more thrilling it is, the more the rest of my life is blocked out. Yeah. So I don't have to, So though I can't ride a roller coaster every minute of the day, but I look for that adrenaline and that it external kind of 
stimulation that pulls me out of my own head. Right. Versus the day-to-day distraction of, oh, this looks scary. I'm just going to get on my phone and watch YouTube and do nothing else but that, right? That, that we want to push away from so that we're, we are living life. I try. Yeah. I have yeah. an obsession with that, too. I have <laughs> yeah. a fear. One of my fears is, as, as uh, Oprah put it so eloquently, the fear of missing out. You know, I'm uh, life. FOMO. Yeah. I have a, <laughs> no, a lot of it. My, <laughs> my watch time on, uh, do, you, do you get on your phone? Do you, does sure. It, at the end, of, what's your average daily watch time? Uh, it's probably about two hours. <laughs> really? Do you yeah. think that's a lot? Uh, I'm going to say maybe not compared to what you're going to tell me. So my average watch time, and I'm down now seven and a half hours a day. Wow. Okay. So that, and that's while I'm, I'm multitasking. Yeah. So I'm, I'm so afraid I'm going to miss out on who, what is trending, what's hot, what's happening in the news. What if I'm on a podcast and I don't have a reference to something? I just, mm-hmm. it's just a constant fear of just not knowing, not understanding, not being aware of just not being what's happening outside this room. I'm always like, I just, I I feel like the world is moving on without me. So that's, I have a constant fear. And and those two words you said are so important. What if drives so much of people's lives? Yes. What if? Yeah. Those two words. If we could get the F out of it (laughs) and just say what is. (laughs) Or what I was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It would be great. We got to drop the F. Yeah. There's the solution. There we go. We're dropping the F. This has been so great uh, Mm -hmm. just having an opportunity to talk to you. And more importantly, how thrilled I am to be a partner with No CD has just been one of the highlights of my life. And I can't tell you how many times it comes up in conversation. Awesome. Like just naturally. And I go, just check out this app. <laughs> just make an appointment. Just even if you think for somebody else, talk to somebody face to face, talk to somebody. There is no excuse. It's affordable. It's covered by insurance. It's, uh, it's there. If it's there, use it. Awesome. Well, two things to wrap up with you. One, what's a word or phrase that you use to describe OCD to others? Nightmare. And two, Someone comes up to you and asks you for advice. What's the advice that you tell people? First of all, when somebody comes up to me, I'm fascinated. I'm, 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 I, 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 I'll, my first reaction is an amazing compliment that you just threw me a lifesaver because I really w- uh, was alone and didn't know that there was even anybody that I could share this with. But sharing, and <laughs> this is going to come off like an ad, but it's not an ad. No CD. That's my, that I really do say that. I know that this is a no CD podcast, <laughs> but believe me, believe me, it's worth the moment to set up an appointment and talk to somebody who's a lot smarter than me, who is, there's no downside, right. you know, help is here. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. And thank you everyone for watching the Get to Know OCD podcast with my guest today, Howie Mandel. Thank you, Howie. If you want to see more of this, check out anywhere where you get your favorite podcasts. Look for the Get to Know OCD podcast. Subscribe to the No CD YouTube channel. And if you're looking for help with OCD or related conditions, go to nocd.com or treatmyocd.com. We appreciate you being here today. See you again next time.